Um, so throughout your artistic career, you have worked with film, embroidery, and sculpture. Most recently, you have even directed a special is issue of Vanity Fair, which you dedicated to Italian women, and a front cover for the magazine's third issue of COVID-19. You're obviously a very successful and renowned artist, but who is the real Francesco Vizzoli? How would you define yourself and your identity? Uh, the real Francesco Vezzoli is somebody who um, is uh, obsessed with uh, other people's vanity, other people's celebrity, but I'm not so vain myself uh, and I'm not so famous myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my next question is, um, we're gathered here today as part of the TED Countdown Initiative, which emphasizes the urgency with which we should be fighting climate change. So after listening to the launch event on Saturday, it is clear that, that fighting this issue is inextricably linked to achieving social justice. When producing your pieces, how do you support craftsmanship and artisan knowledge? Well, I have decided that I have nothing against artists that have a, a big studio. Uh, I enormously respect some of those ones, but I, since the beginning, have chosen for myself self-sustainable practices like uh, embroidery like uh, or if i um, uh, delve into practices that demand uh, bigger teams i always uh, uh, so to say um, rely on biggest company and then when the, the project is over i move on to other structures other teams other companies in such a way I have always managed to not to have a car, not to have an assistant, not to have uh, like a real studio, uh, to live in a very uh, modest way, so to say. My projects have always been very ambitious. Uh, I may say that I may even buy for myself extravagant things, but uh, my, my lifestyle and my way of producing things has always been very, very modest, yes. Um, your work reflect, reflects deeply on the contemporary and on popular culture. So what have you noticed about the nature of our society and why do you think we've gotten to the point we're at today where the planet has been overexploited for its resources and the current socioeconomic system is just unsustainable? I would say that a bit like the some, some countries in the world, for example, the United States or United Kingdom at the moment, uh, there are... The, the world uh, in general is, is a bit in a state of schizophrenia, so to say. There are some, some good preachers, some great philosophers, some people, some, some great politicians, uh, the Pope. Uh, the, you know, the, there are some key figures that do address issues that should be solved. And people in general uh, show uh, commitment, they show uh, they show respect, uh, they, they show political engagement. Then, as a matter of fact, if you look at numbers on Instagram or if you look at the websites that are the most watched uh, on, in, 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 over the net, etc., etc., or if you look at what kind of TV programs are most followed, or people who have more followers on Instagram, you do realize that there is a huge gap between all the goodwill and and all the say and, and all our weaknesses. <laughs> so I do believe there is a lot of goodwill and a lot of people that declare that goodwill, but then after dinner they fall into the traps of their own addictions or or, or weaknesses. So I think that that's where the the gap lies. I I could express this when it comes to let's say, uh, you know, just one of the many issues, uh, you know, body shaming, for instance, you know, everybody's against body shaming. Um, Vanity Fair, after the issue we did, they did a cover with uh, one of the most important actors in Italy, uh, completely naked and, uh, and, and entirely about the, the complex relationship she has with her body, etc., etc. And, the, you know, the issue was welcomed uh, with, with great uh, acclaim all over the, the media in Italy and in Europe. Uh, so, in theory, everybody is against body shaming. In theory, everybody is about uh, the acceptance for, for, for flows. But then, when it comes to true desire, uh, we, we don't know 
how it really goes. And I could say the same about, you know, our relationship to climate change, our relationship to racism. You know, we're all full of goodwill on the social media, but uh, it's still to be verified uh, how, how noble we are in our own private lives. A, a sort of another aspect of your art is that it's very much focused on exploring the boundaries between the past and the present. So what are the merits of this approach and what are the lessons you've learned that we should bring into our contemporary society? Oh, for me, it's very simple. Whenever I get asked about this topic, I do say that uh, what we read as history of the past, of our past, was the gossip of 2000 years ago. So we should not approach the study of history or the study of archaeology as something dusty or boring or pompous. It's actually, we are just studying ourselves 2000 years ago. And what we will realize is that ourselves 2000 years ago uh, were much more similar to ourselves today than we would ever imagine. So I would say that um, what the study of history, uh, not just uh, historical art, but the, of history in general, ancient history even more, will, uh, will be interesting and pivotal uh, is, is really to understand more of ourselves. If we look at the, uh, at the, the path of figures like Donald Trump and we look at somebody like Caligula, uh, we do see, or Nero, I mean, we do see very worrying similarities. And, uh, and so the world has never changed. And uh, again, you know, you know, that is what's surprising, that we never learn from our mistakes. And if I may add one thing, is not by erasing those mistakes, is not by taking certain books out of bibliotheque, is not by destroying certain statues that we will no longer make mistakes. Actually, is by studying the mistakes very deeply and in the right political perspective that we will learn to make no longer. Does it make sense? Um, in May 2020, you launched a zero-budget project called Love Stories with the Prada Foundation. It was described as defining the ephemeral and instantaneous nature of Instagram, transforming it into a virtual place of social investigation, artistic reflection, and intellectual provocation. What were the most important takeaways for you from this initiative? Well, first of all, uh, this is a very selfish answer. The first most important takeaway was the fact that I could work in a state of isolation. And so that I was still able to produce art, at least art from my point of view, and that I was still able to engage people from my own bedroom, full stop, which, was, which is the, the place where I stayed for, you know, locked in for about three to four months. So uh, that was already very encouraging because obviously uh, we all have different standards of producing an artwork. And I have in certain periods of my career, for me producing an artwork was to produce, you know, a video with a, with a cast of uh, 30 super famous actors and uh, a team of 100 director of photography, lighter, gaffers, key grips, et cetera, et cetera. So the fact that I could shift into just to transform my thoughts into concepts that then could reach a lot of people and see a lot of people reaction was, was a big achievement. And for me, the other most important achievement without sounding too arrogant was an attempt to make a precise statement of what art and social media can be. For me, the institutions or the gallery that use the social media just as a device like television or cinema or whatever, uh, just to, 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 to just, a, just, a vis just as a visual support where they put you know, their viewing rooms, etc. It's perfectly understandable because they have, they have to keep up with their business, but that's not work with social media. To make an artwork with social media or to, to, to make art in relationship with social media is connect to a broader audience, is to produce projects that speak to a broader audience and actually use the tools of social media uh, in, in, in a way that responds to people that are always using social media. 
So that's it. It's not about putting on Instagram on your profile images of your exhibition. That has got nothing to do with that. I hope made sense. I'm making sense. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, so um, you know, we've we've talked about a lot of different things up to now. Um, but I do want to ask you the question. So at the TED launch event on Saturday, Pope Francis that you did mention at the beginning highlighted creativity as one of the key qualities to be a leader and implement change. How do your pieces seek to change the world? <laughs> I don't think I am that ambitious, but uh, it would be already a lot to change the art world. <laughs> uh, I, I would say that, you know, many people are obsessed with the market and uh, I think Pope Francis wouldn't approve of that, of course. Uh, and uh, I am not obsessively against the market. I think markets do exist wherever there is creativity. But the more the market grows, the more the ambition of the creativity has to grow as well. So uh, my, my, my attempt to change things is to really push the boundaries and make projects that go broader. If the art world has grown, well, the only possible consequences that, that I see is that the audience must grow as well, not the turnover, not the, just the financial turnover. So if, if art has become such an art and creativity have become such, a, such an important element of our culture, contemporary art, I mean as well, well then, good if some people are are cashing in on that but but all those financial energies must be put into into foundations or institutions that then can propel as well you know ballet russe to use a metaphor you know it cannot only be just painting and sculpture or like uh, a gallerist have just made a project about he was used to say my openings have to be choreographed like ballet i mean we have to still put some kind of true, raw, uh, non-financially oriented creative energy into what we do. Um, and and do, you, do you remain hopeful for this sort of vision that you're outlining here? Do you think that creativity will have the sort of the force and the energy that it requires to sort of have a better future? Uh, well, I mean, I am hopeful because I've seen that in, in my own career and life, when the market is not in love with me, some other people fall in love with me and they give me a magazine to edit. And then if then the market falls back in love with me, uh, well then good, but uh, maybe I'd say you didn't look well enough. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm, I think it's all about the capability of diversifying ourselves and being more uh, upset, accepting of diversity, not just in, in terms of uh, gender orientation or, um, uh, or, you know, political terms. I'd say since we live in a post-ideological world, we do all have to be more open in general. And artists as well should be more open. You know, for instance, if, uh, if I were either Luke Toymans, either uh, the editor-in-chief of American Vogue, I would give American Vogue to Luke Toymans to edit. But the thing is that maybe Luke Toymans would say no. And that would be a shame because I would love to see what Luke Toymans would do coming from such a different aesthetic of a glossy like American Vogue. Does it make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. It does make sense. Um, and sort of summing up everything we've spoken about so far, if you were to give sort of our viewers today um, some, sort of, some sort of tips on how to uh, um, sort of pursue, you know, either this creativity or whatever they sort of want to do to contribute to climate change or just any other project, what would you sort of say to them? Well, I would say to them to uh, be true to their time uh not don't be don't be true don't be too uh, uh uh submissive in front of the politics of art the politics of uh, institutions the politics of curators just be true to your time 
so first read the historical moment you live in and then produce something that you feel uh, reflects in terms of medium and content the historical moment you're living in even if it doesn't seem to fit the system then fight to find your work a place within the system that would be my advice because sometimes at least in the last 20 30 years uh, I, I, I would say until the end of the past century contemporary art was anticipating the world and after the the arrival of, uh, of, of the internet and of social media, I think contemporary art sometimes has been a bit behind. And uh, so I would give this advice, I don't know if it can be useful, but I would say to any young artist, look at the world and, and produce something in the language that reflects the language that the people of your age are using, not the language that the art world is uh, accustomed to. Does it make sense? I'm interested in so sort of assessing everything you've done. Um, do you believe in this, in this power of social media as a vessel to um, sort of to, to implement social change or um, would you sort of um, be for more, I don't know, traditional or different kind of approaches? I'll give, I'll give you a very simple answer. As an artist, I've dedicated so far pretty much my entire career to study the media, the way media insinuates in our life, the way media promote themselves, the way media promote people or products. So with the birth of social media, I mean, I, I mean, imagine, you know, some of my artworks were a trailer for a movie that didn't exist, uh, uh, an election campaign for candidates that didn't exist, a premiere of a, of a theater play that would have never been uh, uh, replicated. So, of course, I'm totally immersed into the language of media, and now, even more so, I'm fascinated by the power of social media. And I think if we are here talking, we're talking so much about social media because specifically the issue you are bringing up can be addressed through social media. And not, I'm afraid, you know, yes, you can address all those issues through a painting. Uh, I remember a beautiful painting by Rilke Tiravaninja. It was an oil painting and there was a, a text about oil. And of course it was a conceptual piece about, you know, like pollution, etc. But all of that has been already done 10, 20, 30 years ago. So this is what I was referring to exactly in our previous uh, in my previous answer, you know, that in one way or another, younger artists have to use the, the media that reflect the age they are living and their own age. So digital painting, TikTok, uh, uh, make a fake TikTok thing uh, for climate change. I'll watch it immediately, you know. Uh, if you make a serious painting uh, against uh, 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 climate change, uh, yes, it can be as interesting, but, but, but I think the medium should reflect the urgency of the, of the, of the, of the issues.